Hey guys, it's Ruben. So I'm here with Gina and Gina has a great smile first and foremost. So if you guys look at her profile <laughs> picture on LinkedIn, she has this very, very kind of awesome smile and just this cool vibe. Gina, tell me about yourself. You've got so many things going on. You've got a firm, you're a keynote speaker, you're a podcaster and an author. Yeah. Yeah. And soon to be a co-working space operator. Um, wow. Yeah, there's a lot of things. I don't know if I'm easily distracted by shiny objects, which I'm sure is part of it. But I think to be in this industry, we have to be able to be following trends. And, you know, I didn't ever intend to be doing what I'm doing, but here I am. It all started really 24 years ago, almost 25 years ago, wanting to start a training company because I was in a sales and marketing role and I was a regional sales director and I wanted to start my own business. And so kind of took the leap and was working with companies individually. So I would go out and work with their teams on their marketing campaigns and so forth. And just it was that intersection of technology coming on the scene at the right time. And I'm always curious about new tools. So I jump in right away and try things out. And then people came up and said, can you just do this for us? And what I learned is while everybody knows they should be using tech tools, nobody really wants to spend the time. And so that kind of got me going, oh, maybe we can do this for companies and started a digital agency where we manage the digital marketing. We we have bloggers, email marketing, lead gen. We help produce podcasts and write social media content. We do customer service in the social space for a couple hotels. And so it's, yeah, it's been a crazy ride of going through that. And then the fact that we have 12 people on our team and we really wanted to spend more time together, I started thinking we need to move into a co-working space, but I couldn't find one that I really liked. So I thought I should start my own. And so, <laughs> so we're opening a female focused co-working space here in South Denver should be open January 2020. So yeah, that's my whole life. Aside from, you know, having four kids and running crazy all the time, my life in a nutshell. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, what I really connect to about that is that I was recently talking to someone about selling to enterprise, selling to medium to larger size businesses. And they had said something that was kind of intriguing to me. They said, you know, they don't care about the technology. They don't care about I's and O's and ones and zeros and stuff. They care about results. They care about growth. They care about revenue, even not necessarily even profit, but top line revenue, because right. that's kind of the growth trajectory. And of course, with technology, especially a lot of those numbers in the back end sort of ultimately get kind of sorted out and figured out. So I really like your model of an all-in-one agency that kind of helps with a lot of those really important things. Because you really, what you, I think, just did was touched upon our go-to market strategy, which is all rooted in original content. Right. I love that you have that because the last thing I think that a business wants to do is to have four different vendors to contract all of these individual things out. Why not go to one vendor like yourself that has the vision and actually the team to execute? Yeah. And the reality, a lot of times in the beginning, we were helping companies understand, put together a strategy, understand the pieces they needed, and then work with their teams. But then a couple months would go by and I would look and they started off doing it. And then it just, you know, flatlined. And the reality is it's so time consuming. And, you know, anything, I mean, look how many times, how long have we been talking about the need to do more video? And everybody knows it and everybody says they're going to do it, but the reality is they don't do it. And it's the implementation that gets lost, even though companies know the value. And I feel like live video and sending short videos out to people is such a great tool to connect, but people still aren't doing it. And I just, I beat my head against the wall going, I don't get it with our clients. What's in your way? What's in your way? And the need for perfection is a lot of it. They feel like it has to be hard. It has to be high tech. There has to be a lot of difficult things in order for it to be worth sending out. And so they don't do it. Why do so, you think that is? What do you think the block is? I mean, I think a lot of it is ego. Number one, yeah. nobody wants to be on camera. Number two, I feel like I have some clients that are so good on camera and they get out and they'll speak to audiences, but they fear making a mistake on camera. And so they would rather pre-record, which I love all the videos you guys send out because I love all the blooper parts. Those are my favorite parts. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what I try to get across is it's the bloopers in life that make people connect to you because they say, well, you're just like me. And I feel like in social media and in marketing in general, 
general is the more we can build that likability factor, the more people are drawn to your brand. And I think when we're looking at putting together our strategies with most of our clients, we're saying, yeah, you're just like everybody else. (laughs) It's like, what makes you really different is you, you know, you're the personality of the brand and even a bigger brand. How do you get the personality to shine? And that's usually through the humanness of the brand. Let me meet the people there, you know, to quit being perfect at things. Talk to us. And there's a lot of that. And, and in social media, it's, it's the same thing of, you know, you can put out tons of just content that's not going to connect, or you can try to get real with people and connect, which is why I wrote that book, Social Media Doesn't Work, because everybody says, if we could just have more stuff being sent out, you know, more followers, we need more followers, but it doesn't work unless you do. And the reality is, it's the work that people don't want to do. So I think there's the ego and there's the time. People don't have the time. I completely connect to that. I went through this process where I realized a couple of things. Number one was that all of the things that I was doing internally, creating decks, having kind of closed calls, those meet and greets, the coffee, you know, all those could get converted. I'd say the vast majority of those could get converted into content opportunities, kind of like this conversation. We could have had a, hey, let's meet for coffee. This is the first time that you and I are talking. We have never spoken before. And the power of video, the power of a podcast connects to people like this where we can share these original thoughts. It's tremendous to me, you know? It is. And it's a missed opportunity by most brands. I mean, again, I say we've been preaching this same message and it gets exhausting being the, you know, the evangelist all the time. But I feel like for 12 years now, I've been preaching technology to people that I'm going, you know what, I'm done preaching it. You either get it or you don't. And how do you not look and see the brands that are doing things to connect with people through video calls, through live video streaming, through podcasting. Like these are things that are proven to help people connect better with a brand and bring the human factor into your marketing, but people still don't do it. John Lennon once said a very famous quote, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. I love that quote. I think in terms of trust building and humanizing overall people, I think that trust gets built when you're planning other stuff. You know, when I'm planning to have some perfect production or when I'm planning to be able to read from a script or have a perfect webinar, it's the in-between moments and the bloopers and the mess ups and the realizations, you know, the pontifications that we have during those moments that we either have internally or we share in our expositional about it. And in doing so, that's actually what makes us sort of relatable, you know? So I love the fact that you mentioned that you like our bloopers. I think those are the best parts. Those are the best parts. And it's true, even when you see, I mean, I spent 15 years as a keynote speaker, going out and speaking at conferences, and I saw the same thing. The speakers who were perfect, It's a sickness as a human in our society because when somebody is perfect on stage, I almost want to see them fall. I want to see them mess up. I want to see them do something wrong so I can go, okay, finally, they're like me. So when I'm up there speaking, I'm always willing to call out my own foibles and willing to say, okay, I just was about to say something brilliant and I completely lost my train of thought. And then I'll usually make a joke about it going, who in the room knows what I was going to say next? Because everybody wants to see that you're just like them. And I think the more we can bring that to an audience whether it's in person or whether that's via video, somehow we have to get that out to our audiences. And I think there are some that are afraid to ever let people know that they're not perfect. Speaking is definitely also a newish thing for me within the last, I'd say, two years. And that is a revelation that I had for myself that if I don't speak and sort of lean into the imperfections and the screw ups and, you know, not sleeping the night before, being on a red eye flight, if I don't speak to those things, then they kind of quietly haunt me on the inside and I can't be my best self. But if I diffuse them and sort of put them out there, then all of a sudden what happens is to your point, I become a human and I become relatable and, you know, fallible. And I think that's what really, I think really connects and I think builds the trust. So, and I think that's the likability factor. When I always say, you know, years ago, I used to look at that and say, what makes someone likable? Is it charm? Is it, you know, what is it about the personality? Is it, there's a lot of things built into it, like sense humor and, and a sense of humor is being able to laugh at yourself and being able to say, you know, okay, I just, I dropped that. Or I, I've seen people do make a mistake and get so flustered by it. Mm-hmm. And you could almost see them start to sweat because they're thinking, oh my gosh, I hope nobody saw that. 
Well, of course, everybody saw that. And, you know, in the speaker side of things, I used to always say, you can't get up and give a presentation or you're going to have problems. Get up and have a conversation. And then it's two way. Even if you are speaking to your audience, it's still two way because you're feeding off of things that they're doing or saying. And a conversation it kind of can go wherever the audience needs it to go. But if I come in and say, I've got, you know, usually it's way too many. I have 87 slides I got to get through in 20 <laughs> minutes. You're going to kill people and they're going to hate you. And, you know, I always tell people, quit putting up a read along and pretending that's a presentation. It's like, get up and have a conversation. Same thing with video. If you know your stuff, then you can get on video and talk about it. And if you make a mistake, so you make a mistake. You would make that same mistake, which is the point I always tell our clients is on video. If you make a mistake, this is what you look like if you were having coffee with someone. You would make that same mistake talking to somebody. You would have to correct yourself. You would have to, you know, when somebody says, oh, I hate the way I look on video, I always remind them, you know what? That's kind of what you look like in person too. So <laughs> <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> I don't know how you hide it in person, but on video, you're trying to hide it. And that's what you look like. It's better to just find the comfort that you so need with your rhetoric and with your overall appearance that confidence is I think really critical it is and I don't know maybe it comes as we age I mean I can remember being a lot younger and worrying about what people thought and worrying that you know they were going to be judging something about me other than the message I had and then you kind of get to a point going look I mean I've been around I know some stuff if you're willing to have a conversation about it I'm willing to share the stories and I think somehow in marketing it's getting those real stories out that draws people in. And, you know, I'm fascinated with storytelling and I just feel like stories draw people like a moth to a flame, that they lean in, they want to hear more. And when you're real with them and you're not trying to sell them, they can't help but want more. And that to me is the best marketing. And so, you know, social media's job is just to shine a light to kind of catch your attention in the scrolling that we're doing catch your attention long enough to point you to something else, a bigger piece of that story, which then should pull you in closer to say, tell me more. I love that. So speaking of storytelling, I mean, you've gone through a journey as a speaker, as an entrepreneur, you know, as someone that's continuing to take risk. Give me some of your war stories. Uh, tell me how you endured those and how you really overcame them. That has been what I've been living in the last few weeks is just, there are so many war stories and so many times that you are beaten down. And as an entrepreneur, I think you just have to learn the rhythm of the journey. And there are weeks when you're on top and you're like, I am a rock star. There's nothing I can't do. And then 48 hours later, you are beaten and you're going, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea how I'm going to get out of this or how we're going to build this back. And so I think as an entrepreneur, it's just learning that it's all about the long game and it's getting up every day whether you want to or not and showing up again and saying okay let's strap the armor on again because we're back in the battle and once you know I mean again I've been doing it for 24 years I mean you know after a while you kind of you recognize those those rhythms and you say okay it's it's one of those weeks where I just need to go into a productive mode and I need to there are weeks where I'm not feeling creative so I, I need to be all about the productivity and let's get through these other things that I have to get done and then the next week I might be super inspired by something a conversation I had or last week I was at a construction girl event where these young high school girls who learn about the construction industry were up on a stage speaking and I was blown away by them and I was so inspired and you know then all of a sudden you go okay what I'm doing has purpose and it brings you up to the high so I just think the war stories which I've had so many from making bad hires to in the beginning, not even hiring, trying to do everything myself and realizing, okay, I can't do that. But, you know, also perspective, I think, helps you deal with things when you have a really bad week as, you know, as an entrepreneur to, you know, maybe you have a client who says everything's a crisis and something fell apart and they think the whole world's coming apart. And you're saying, okay, first of all, we're not doing surgery here. We're talking about social media or a blog post. And let's put this in perspective. And I think having life experiences always brings that perspective into our business as well. And fortunately, I guess I should say fortunately, I've had a lot of life experiences from tragedies and heartaches to incredible highs. And I think that's what brings as an entrepreneur saying, bring that in every day. Like when people say, leave it at the door, no, bring it in because that gives me the weapons that I need to say, this is easy. I thought this was hard, 
that was hard. This is easy. Got it. Yeah. And then what would you say your kind of most natural wheelhouse is, your kind of ideal client? Who do you resonate with the most? Small, large? I noticed that you kind of cater to food and beverage, hotel, on franchise, et cetera. Uh, I can learn about that. Yeah, which that's one area. I always wish, oh, everybody says, have a niche, have a niche. I've never been able to find that niche. I mean, we do a lot in the health and wellness. So we have a lot of fitness gyms. and But then we have a couple software companies. The, the ideal is a company that's large enough that, number one, they have the budget. Because I always say, you know, we're not an agency that you're going to bring in if you're a solopreneur and you can't afford to hire a part-time person. But when a company is large enough, you would hope they would have their own team in-house that's doing all of the things that we do. But we have a couple of companies that have, you know, a 10-person marketing team, and then they still outsource the social side because it changes so much. So I would say, you know, our ideal company is anywhere between probably four to $15 million companies, and they know the value that they have to be out there and connecting, but they also know the value in having conversations with people online. So, you know, we do a lot, like I said, customer service and knowing you have to get back to people and respond and at the same time putting out great content and connecting. This year has been our year of let's scale back on automation and let's try to bring in that human element, which I think, you know, a lot of the video how are we using and how are we helping our clients use small areas of video to help them be more human to their audiences? And, you know, looking, there's so many ways. I mean, there's so many things. I mean, you know, you're the king in this area. This is what we need to be doing. We need to be connecting in a human way. And so the ideal client is one who sees and knows that and allows us to come alongside and help them do it. Well, I think from my perspective, what's interesting about this is that I think with social media, with video, I think what people are used to having kind of a top down approach where they see big videos, a lot of views, everyone wants to get that quote unquote viral video, everyone right. wants to get that thing on Facebook, that thing on YouTube. And now I think people are realizing, to your point, that personalization is really important. Intimate human conversations, one-to-one, -one, just like this, whether it's a recorded situation or whether it's asynchronous or whether it's a tutorial video. You know, I love this idea of speaking to the camera, but then speaking to, it's just one person that you're really speaking to. And then you can sort of take that asset, you can take that content, distribute it across larger channels, but that investment, that commitment, that cadence of doing that a lot with repetition, I think that's the future now. Before, I think marketers and communicators and business people used to say, I want to create a firework and I want to hope that I get lucky. And now I think people are realizing that it's the investment and that it's the long term. It's the long game, to your point. It is. And you know, when you think about people, I mean, I always laugh because on TV, the um, progressive insurance, I, for some reason, insurance companies, they must have a good marketing budget. Because they're Geico and Progressive, they're funny. Their videos are funny. So people in their videos like flow. And now there's the new character that they introduced through Progressive Insurance. Oh, I'm going to draw a blank as I'm like Justin or Jason. or He's like the goofy sidekick oh, for yeah. flow. Right. <laughs> and seeing those 30-second videos over and over and over, I like them. Like, I want him to have his own show is what I want because he's so dang funny. And I just go... Okay, what are they doing? They're creating little stories, 30 second commercials, but they're little video stories that get us to know, like, and trust them. Now, how do you take that and apply that in our business? It's like you said, it's not the big flash, even though obviously they have a big budget and they're doing TV commercials, but it's taking that concept and saying, how do we show up in 30 seconds and tell a snippet of a story over and over and over because I like them and it's through these short little videos. I'm not saying that every one of their videos is a hit, but all of a sudden we know Flo, we know her goofy sister who's on the exercise bike and ignore, I mean, I just am fascinated by their marketing because I go, they're insurance. They're selling something very unsexy and yet they're telling this story with humor and in short little stories that get us to know, like, and trust them. And I think we can do that. I think in brands, we just have to get creative and let go of the perfection. And what would you say your secret sauce is in your mix? I think it's one of those things of the personalization. It's not a cookie cutter. You know, people say, well, you know, we just want five Facebook posts per week and two email campaigns sent out per month. It's like, throw that formula away and say, what does it take to get people to draw in closer to you? 
What does that take? Is it five posts really on Facebook? Or it, do we need to do something different? Is there a formula? Whenever you have something interesting to say, you know, it's throw away what you think used to work on social media because it, it has changed. And what used to work doesn't work anymore. And, you know, it used to be about the numbers. Now it's about, I wish I could tell our clients, convince them, get rid of all the emails in your list who haven't opened an email in six months. Get rid of them. Cut them out. Dump that list. And then take the people, even if it's 100, and start sending real heartfelt love letters to them. That's what I feel like makes us different because we're trying to get our clients to think that way of how can you draw closer and build better relationships, go deeper with the people who really like you already. Forget about the people that you have on a list because somebody told you you needed 100,000 people on your email list, but they never open your emails. Or you needed 10,000 people to follow you on LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever, but none of them read your content or reply. So, you know, how can we drill down and become more intimate with them? What I really uh, connect to on this is that I think people have an idea of what social and what content is supposed to look like. And I think a lot of the times, not all the times, but a lot of the times, I'll be frustrated about what their vision is. And the vision is, we just need to do something. We need to have a presence. We need to get photos. They need to look sort of corporate and perfect. We need to just put our stuff out there. And not a lot of people are brave enough or vulnerable enough potentially to actually say, you know what, we're just gonna be humans and we're just gonna show our stories. And if we make mistakes and if our office is a mess and if we have an accident, we're just gonna show that. And we're, as long as we're not off brand, as long as we're honest and you know there's kind of an overarching positive theme here you know we're going to push that message and i think right. that what i really connect to with what you're saying is that you know you're coming at this from a coach's perspective from an educator's perspective from someone that has been through the ringer that has had those experiences that has consumed content create content and i love the fact that you might i could picture you telling a prospect or a client that's actually not a good idea you don't want to do that it's rather this yeah. that you have to do and that's really what I believe is essential for a consultant, for a service provider, for And I'm agency. constantly telling our team that our job is not to do what the client asks us to do. Our job is to tell the client, here's what we need to try. And in marketing, it's about experimenting. And just last week, I was on the call with one of our clients and they were saying something about, well, this guy came in, he was telling us that our content, we need to do this with getting on directories and getting more you know, backlinks. And I said, stop, stop. I said, here's what you need to do. You need to say, what are your potential clients Googling right now? Or what are they asking Siri or Alexa or whoever they're asking? What are they searching for in your industry? What question? Write it down specifically and tell me what it is. And they're like, what do you mean? What does somebody go to Google and type in when they're looking for your services? That's SEO. Let's write content and let's create content that answers that question because that's your best. You know, to me, I get fired up when people think, well, somebody said that I should be listed on a directory. I got, yeah, you'll be listed on a directory in another country with the Viagra ad next to you. That's who they're telling you you should, because it's all fake and purchased. And, you know, people are so caught up in the vanity metrics still to this day that they overlook the fact that I had a client ask us, can't we just buy Facebook likes? And it just blew my mind. Seriously, <laughs> this is 2019 and you're wanting to buy likes on your page. Do you think those fake accounts will ever purchase from you? That's only going to hurt you. And then you can never run ads because now Facebook goes, oh, let's target the people who like you. And those are all fake. So I get fired up on certain things and tell our clients, no, 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 we can't do that. Or you shouldn't work with us because you shouldn't even hire anybody. You can go to Fiverr and get all those things done <laughs> and don't even pay anybody to do this for you. They'll do it for $5 or whatever they charge now. But yeah, it's just looking at what's the reality today of what is marketing and how do you create content that makes people want to lean in and know more about you. And that to me, that's brilliant marketing. That is, that is, we get offers a lot on the pull back backlink thing where people yeah. say, Hey, we'd love to put your link on this. We'd love to guest post. We get that a lot. We actually ignore all of those. We don't address those. It's just not worth it for it's us. It's not because, worth your time. Yeah. yeah. We, two clicks in, you'll realize, you know what, this is not where we need to be. And we understand the game and you actually go a couple of clicks in, you sort of see what their general kind of engagement is. And it's just not impressive. Or they're attracting an audience that you may not want. 
that will never purchase from you. And so you're saying, why would you let them put a link to you from their audience that has nothing to do with what you, you know, it's, they're attracting a different type of person. And, and we've had a client that all of his content was attracting millions of views on YouTube, millions of views, no sales, but millions of views on YouTube. And it was because the people who were attracted to his content were young, had no money. They were teachers, students, people that love watching, you know, things blow up, but they didn't have the money to purchase the items that he was really wanting to sell. And, you know, looking at that saying, what is your object? Is the objective a vanity metric? Is it that you want a million views on YouTube? Or do we need to really attract a different audience? Because the people you're attracting, they're not purchasing. But maybe if we look at a different audience, and if you want to do both, that's fine, but you're not going to get sales from this audience over here that you're wanting. But if we attract this audience over here, it's the parents, it's the moms. that are. Let's get some mom bloggers on board because they're going to sell your stuff. And, you know, just looking at kind of the reality of marketing versus vanity. It's hard. It's hard when every day we see, oh, another celebrity is endorsing this and another influencer is doing that. <laughs> you're going... Is that going to help your business or is it just going to help your ego? Right, right. You know? Well, I, I think there's a whole shakeup thing that's happening right now with the whole influencer movement where right. it's been completely scrutinized and there's, you know, a lot of fallout. And what is your take on that? I'm curious about this whole influencer movement. I mean, I think it's interesting. I think Instagram and Facebook are trying to do some things to help, you know, as a marketer. I don't like some of these things that they're doing. Now we can't see how many people have liked a post or they're going to start moving to those. I just think we've gotten, and I say we've gotten, it's a very young audience, but it's influencing the decisions of other people. They're seeing how this influencer marketing is helping a brand, but it's helping them do what? You know, like I always ask, what is your real objective? If your objective is sales and getting money, people to actually make a purchase from you, then that may be a different strategy than just getting a bunch of likes on your posts over here because an influencer talked about you. And it's a tough thing to get people, again, off of the likes and the, con it's not even comments because most of them are just likes on things. And, you know, getting people to say, will that get you sales for your business? So here's a question for you. If marketers and storytellers are trying to come up with their brand voice for social, what are some practices that they can pursue to really create that? I think that's something that I hear a lot that people struggle with. What is our voice? What is our corporate voice? Yeah, I mean, it is interesting because, I mean, the voice of a brand is the personality, the heartbeat of that brand. And it does start from the top. So a lot of times we have people saying, you know, we want to come across as this. We want to come across. But when you walk through the company, you're going, you're not that. That's not who you are. You know, we always say our job is to magnify the voice of a brand unless or the personality, unless that brand has no voice and no personality. And it's like, wow, how do you create a personality where there is none? You really have to dig into a brand to say, what is the story? And a lot of times it's kind of what you said in the beginning, your origin story. What is the origin story of a brand? And why did you start this company? And it's kind of like getting to a service industry and saying, let's go back to the days. Remember when you liked people? And remember when you started this because you wanted to help somebody? It's what is that story? And tell that story, whether it's through video, but somehow you have to do some really good storytelling. And sometimes that storytelling just has to be internal first because Maybe your own teams don't even know the power of your origin story and the purpose behind what you're doing. And once the teams and once the whole you know company starts understanding this is why we exist, I mean, I'm surprised how many times you ask a company, why are you here? You'll hear different things from different leaders. So I think it needs to start from the top. What is the origin story? And has that story evolved? And what is it today? What is the story of your brand today? And how are you telling that story internally versus externally? One of the things that I do to share my stories, if I don't have the time to actually get in there and write, is I do a lot of recording. So I do a lot of car recording. I do a lot of voice recording. And then that recording actually gets converted into a lot of things. It gets converted into, you know, some sort of a content calendar or blog posts. I'm in the process right now of actually writing a book called Click Record, which is actually my first book. So I'd love to love get it. some feedback from you at some point on that, um, going through the process of looking for a publisher and kind of, you know, going through the edit and whatnot. So yeah. it's, it's pretty much wrapped up. But going through that process, any kind of recommendations that you can give folks to make, to sort of get 
content as part of their at least weekly flow, you know, picking up their camera, taking photos, events, you know, walk and talk videos. And it is interesting because I used to always say every one of us has an obligation to blog. That used to be my mantra. Every person. I go, I don't care if you're in business, if you're a leader, I don't care. We need to be getting our stories out of our head, our experiences out of our head, whether that is for our own family. If for nothing else, what are you leaving behind for your family to read? Or it's for that next generation coming up. And one of the things back in the day of the little flip cameras, remember those little flip cameras? Oh my gosh, I was obsessed with those. I had five different flip cameras. I don't know why. I think because you could customize the outsides of them. I just collected them. But I used to tell people, buy one of these flip cameras and I want you to interview your top leaders and just ask them one question to share on video. What do you know now that you wish you would have known when you started? And just sharing that type of wisdom in short little nuggets, whether it's video, whether it's written, most people say they can't write, which I find fascinating. You know, did you pass first grade? Yes, you can write. But the time to write and get our thoughts down is hard to sit down. So I love the fact that now you're right on our phones. We can click open an audio file and just talk into that. Some people are bothered by that. They're like, oh, I feel funny. You know, what if people hear me? I don't want to record You know, you have to find the medium that's most comfortable, whether that's video. To me, it's easy to just turn on a video and create a short video, load it to YouTube in a private channel if you're not comfortable yet. But then those could be great video archives later. And, you know, maybe you'll take them and edit them. But I feel like each of us have something through our life experiences, through our work experiences, through our industry expertise that we should be sharing. And sometimes it's just the journey. What is the journey to get where we are? And what have we learned? I read a book called The Artist's Way, and it's a popular book for people who are writers and creatives. And in that, she talks about doing the daily pages. Every day, you're to write three pages nonstop. You just put your pen down and write three pages. And it might just be, I have nothing to say today. I'm trying to think of what to write. Oh, here's all the things that are scattering in my head right now. And I write those things down. And then, you know, last week, the theme of my whole week tended to be this. And you just start writing. All of a sudden, you get a a chunk that you're going, wow, this would be a great blog post. And I'll take that sometimes and end up making a blog post. I spoke at a conference a little over a week ago. And the whole topic that they had been pitching that I was going to be speaking on really developed the week before I spoke because it was something that came out of my daily writing. And these are writings that maybe no one will ever see. Maybe when I'm dead and gone, people will, my kids will find it and go, wow, she had a lot to say. (laughs) But I have three blogs right now that I contribute to, and that's our business blog. So it's anything having to do with kind of digital marketing stuff. Then I have the village workspace, which is our co-working space. And I kind of write about the entrepreneurial journey, any of those stories that come to my head. And then I have one called Gina Unplugged. And those are usually things like I climbed Kilimanjaro. What did I learn on that climb? And I wrote it every day. I blogged while I was on the mountain and my son, you know, went through Columbine. He was at the school during the shooting. I, I needed a place where I could write about that, but it wasn't on a business blog. And so, you know, I think we put pressure on ourselves that when we create content, it has to be this amazing piece of content that's going to go viral. I think we need to just look at how can I share my stories with those who might be interested. And maybe there's no one that's interested, but it needs to be captured somewhere. And I would really encourage people to really consider start contributing to that bigger body of knowledge because there's somebody out there that needs to know what you've already learned. Um, You are also your blogs, please. Yeah. Gina Unplugged is just ginaunplugged.com is one of them. And then the villageworkspace.com is the blog at the Village Workspace. And I blog there about entrepreneurship and then social connects, socialknx.com is the marketing blog. Got it. And you mentioned that you had a climb. You climbed Kilimanjaro. That was one when I was turning 50. I said, okay, I need to do something big. Turning 50 is a big deal. I want to do something kind of cool. And and my husband's a huge outdoors. He's a martial artist and he's done all kinds of crazy stuff and did a Denali ice climb and like super crazy. And I said, you know what? Kilimanjaro looked like that looks pretty easy. I think to climb Kilimanjaro for my 50th birthday. And so we said, okay. And so we live in Colorado. So we climb a lot of the 14ers here, which are 14,000 foot peaks. So I thought Kilimanjaro is 19,400 or something. So 
that should be easy. What I didn't anticipate is the mental part of living on a mountain for seven days, sleeping in a tent in freezing cold. And I was the only woman in our climbing team. So with all the climbers and the porters, there were 19 men and me, the toilet of terror. I'll just say that. That was my biggest obstacle. (laughs) (laughs) So what was that process like? I mean, did you have to prep for that? What do you do before you prep for that? We did several that summer. We climbed in August. I think we summited like August 8th. And so that summer from June until August, we climbed, I think, three of the 14,000 foot peaks here. Um, None of it was overnight. So again, I think the stamina part I had, because it's like six to eight hours of hiking a day. And so that part was not hard. It was the mental part of, wow, I'm freezing cold. You know, you're sleeping in a tent and I'm not a, I don't know, maybe I look like an outdoors person, but I'm not. (laughs) I'm not a camping girl. And so the camping part on a mountain was really hard. (laughs) Wow. And what are your takeaways? What are your kind of life takeaways from that? Everything to me has a story that applies to business. And that really was all about perseverance. And when things are really hard and day three, I broke down crying that I want like, what am I doing this? I didn't say I wanted to go home. But I was just like, what made me think that this is what I wanted to do? Like, I just want a hot shower right now. And and it just made me realize that there are times in business when you just come up against your mountain and you say, I can't go. But every single 14er that I've climbed here in Colorado, I get about three quarters of the way up. My fingernails start turning blue. My lips start turning blue. And it's so hard. I want to turn back. And I realize sometimes we just have to pause and rest and have a snack. And then all of a sudden, life's good again, and you go again. And I think on Kilimanjaro, it just was that reminder of in business or life, when things are super hard, it's okay to pause. You don't have to quit. You don't have to turn back. You just pause, and you just be still. And all of a sudden, your strength will be renewed. And then have a snack. (laughs) And then you can press on and go again. And, you know, it's asking for help when you need help. That was the only time on Kilimanjaro we were probably almost at 19,000 feet. And I was starting, I didn't have a headache. I didn't have any problems. But I could tell that I was starting to get kind of delirious because I couldn't put my glove back on. I started to cry because I couldn't put my hand in my glove. And I was like super frustrated and crying. And my husband comes over and goes, do you just need help putting your glove on? And he put it on for me. And then all of a sudden it was better. And I thought it's sometimes we don't ask for help at those times when we just are so confused, not knowing that next step. And it was something so simple. So yeah, I took away a lot of lessons from it. And every hardship I've ever gone through, there's always amazing lessons to go write those on a list Because you're going to face another hard time. And all you have to do is look at this list and go, dang, I've done all kinds of good things. You know, and it kind of gives you the confidence to do that next hard thing. Attitude. Attitude is everything, right? You can be a victim and you can say, I can't do it. It's too hard. Or it must be destiny. I'm not supposed to do this because this is hard. Or you can say, wow, this is building incredible character. There's a great quote that I always like to think about this. The problem isn't the problem. The problem is your attitude. It's very true. You know, pardon the cliche, but mind over matter. I mean, you've climbed mountains and that's pretty amazing. And it's also amazing to me how much can be solved by just breathing and taking a breath. Taking a breath. And that was interesting. Last week, this conference that I was speaking at, I got there and I was hurried and I was, I had a bunch of stuff going on this co-working space. We had some big challenges with the construction and I was dealing with all the contractors and architects and I was super frazzled. And I got up to this retreat area that I was speaking at and I just stepped outside and I was just like, oh, I didn't like, I don't want to be here. This isn't what I should be doing right now. And all of a sudden I got out and the wind was just blowing through the trees and it was in this beautiful part of Colorado, in the black forest area. And I got out and I could hear the wind in the trees and I just stood there and just took a deep breath and I was just like this is exactly what I need to be doing exactly where I need to be and just the whole theme that weekend for me was breathe this is what I need right now is I need three days to breathe you mentioned that you had a kid that was there during the Columbine event I can't imagine going through that what was that like Sadly, it was the first event and now we hear it weekly and it's not even like jarring anymore. Yeah. And, you know, he was a freshman at the high school and it was one of those things that we knew he was safe before we knew how bad the whole situation was. He called us from this little hut they were hiding in behind the school and we knew he was safe. So I think of all the parents who had to wait and they went to the school and they waited 20 hours. You know, I look back and I think the lessons that I took away from that is you could do everything right as a parent you're going to have a hard time as a parent sometimes. 
and there'll be things that you can't control. He was a freshman, so we had four years that were so hard, and he wanted to escape life after that, and he, you know, got into drugs, and he ran away, and we brought him to counselors, and he didn't want help, and, you know, he had to find his way, but as a parent, I learned that I couldn't communicate sometimes verbally with him during this because my emotions and his emotions would get in the way, and I started journaling to him. It was probably his junior year, senior year, the whole year, senior year, we journaled back and forth to each other, even though we were in the same house. Writing helped us put into words what we wanted to say without emotions getting in the way. And that has really helped me just passing that nugget on to other parents who are going through tough times with their teenagers or with a spouse. I always say, try writing, try writing, because sometimes you'll be able to say things in writing that you can't say. And it helped us repair our relationship. And he's doing amazing now. And he owns his own business. And he's actually going to be doing all the electrical work on our co-working space. And I'm you know, super proud of him. And yeah, you get through things, but you look back and I don't know how we survived those four years. Emotions get in the way. I really connect to that. Yeah. It's the power of the pen, but it's, it is. it's from an emotional, almost, you know, romantic, interpersonal perspective. You can pour out in writing things that are really hard to say to somebody face to face. And speaking of writing, uh, talk to me about your book. A funny story, because I was speaking at a conference coming up and they booked this about six months, eight months out. And they said, the client wants to buy one of your books for the audience. You know, I wrote a book six years ago called Getting Geeky with Twitter. When Twitter, I saw it was when Twitter first was early on the scene. But anyway, they wanted to buy one of those books. And I said, oh my gosh, that book is so old and it's so outdated. Like that's the bad thing about writing anything in the technology field is a year later, if you wrote anything specific in there, it's no longer relevant. And I had screenshots and I had all kinds of stuff in there. I said, oh, that book is just not relevant. They said, well, do you have anything new coming out? And I said, and in my head, I had a book that I wanted to write called Social Media Doesn't Work Unless You Do. And talking about that, it's it's time consuming and it's not easy and all the things you need to do on all the platforms. And I said to them, oh yeah, well, I've got a book coming out called Social Media Doesn't Work Unless You Do. And they said, well, let me talk to the client and see if they want to buy it. This was eight months before the conference. And I was like, oh my gosh, what did I just say? And they came back saying they want to buy 2,000 copies for the people who will be attending the conference. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, I've got to write a book and get it published, get everything done in eight months. Can this be done? And so I told him, I said, well, I'll get like galley copies for everybody and I'll personalize it. And so I did a spin on it to make it. And I sat down and wrote that book in 30 days. I, wow. I banked it out in 30 days. And what is that process like, you know, for those that want to get into writing a book? I definitely, I mentioned that I'm writing one called Click Record, and I, I haven't figured out what the subline is. I think it's going to be, you know, human stories through video, something like this, working title, not married to it. But give us some guidance on how we can write a book. You get in your chair every day. You know, I heard a great saying, a guy said, put your ass where your heart wants to be. <laughs> and that is, you want to write a book, then get in your chair every day and write. And literally what got me motivated is because I gave them a deadline that I would have this done. And then I backed it up going, okay, I'd have to have it to here. I'd have to have it to the editor. I'd have to have it to this. And so I literally every day would get up and on my calendar block out like three hours. I'm not doing anything but write. And what I did is I took 50,000 words. So in my head, I said, okay, 50,000 word book is about a 200 page book. So 50,000 words divided by 30 days, how many words do I have to write per day? And I did a daily word count. So I knew in my mind, I had to write one to 2,000 words a day. Well, that makes it super doable. Cause you're yeah. like, that's a blog post. Could you write a blog post every day? Of course you can. And if you block that out on your calendar, you can write a book in 30 days. Then it made me go, man, all this time when we tell ourselves this year, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> it's like, yeah. that's such a slacker way to say it. It's like, tell yourself you're going to write it in 30 days. Sit down and you'll write that book in 30 days. And I think it also depends on the topic. Like this was one that was, I know this topic inside and out. I had to research and find case studies, which our team helped me pull stats and things from it. But if it's a topic that you're having to research, it takes longer versus, you know, maybe it's something from the heart. Like I'd love to write a memoir. And that's something now I'm trying to get into that mindset. Can I write something other than a business book? Because I have a crazy life story of finding my dad through DNA testing and like crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. And I would love to write that. But I think that one I could write 
pretty quickly because it's just coming out of my head. But then there's the whole, you know, crafting the right stories. So tips for writing a book or just sit down every day and write. Great. So uh, books written, you know, someone has, you know, 100 pages in a Google Doc or a Microsoft Word. Now they're going through the process of trying to figure out how they're going to distribute it. So do they self-distribute? Do they put it on Amazon? Is it digital? Is it a PDF? Do they find a publisher? You've gone through this process. Give us some tips. Yeah, and I think it really depends on your goals for writing that book. You know, I always tell people, no one's going to become rich unless you're a celebrity author. No one's going to become rich from writing a book. So if you're writing a book so you can make money and that's going to be your product, that's a long haul. You know, I always tell people, tell yourself you're going to make a dollar a book. After paying for your publisher, your editor, the whatever, even if you self-publish, you've got to have somebody that edited the book. Self-publishing, now you've got the cost of printing the book. Nowadays, there's ways you can do print on demand, so you get 200 orders, but you're still making about half. You sell through Amazon, they take 55% of your cost, of your profit. So if you just tell yourself, okay, if I'm writing a book for a dollar a book, am I really going to get rich writing a book? You have to do it for other motives. And so, you know, depends on your motive. If you're going after a big publisher, then you need an agent. Well, the agent's going to say you need to have a good social media following. And it goes back to that whole vicious cycle of vanity metrics, because they are seriously now telling authors, I want to see that you have a lot of Twitter followers. I want to see your email list. I want to see numbers because they want to know you're going to help sell the book because publishers don't sell your book. Publishers produce your book and they'll get it into a couple distribution channels, but it's your job to market that book. And most authors don't have a clue that it's going to take all that work to market their book after they write the book. So, you know, one of the things I did is I wanted to do an audible book as well. And my oldest son is an audio producer. He does music videos and production in California. And so he helped me. I was like, I want to do an audio book and I want to get it on audible through Amazon I don't care about the money part. I just want the experience of going through that. So he helped me do that. And that was hard of just recording your book. But yeah, I think it's just first just need to sit down and write it. If you're wanting to get a big publisher, then you got to be building your audience every day, which I think can be a great story to be told every day. Why not get on video every day and share like, oh, today is one of those hard days. I've got to write this or, you know, it's awesome. I've got my dog at my feet and here's what I'm drinking to get, you know, whatever. Share the journey. Because the more you can bring people along, the more those people will support you when your book is out. Some people wait until the book is done. Then they go, oh, now I need to put together a marketing plan. (laughs) There's a lot of reverse engineering that I'm hearing. Oh, my gosh. A lot. (laughs) Yeah, Number one is figuring out a, a daily cadence to be able to actually produce the content. The other thing is thinking about your marketing strategy before you start writing the book or during that. Yeah. Take your audience, even if it's, you know, a hundred people, bring them with you through the journey. And they're more likely to be your supporters selling your book for you when it comes out versus, okay, now I have a book out. How am I going to publish this? Or how am I going to promote this? It's like, wow, you've got a bunch of strangers you're talking to now. Just to clarify, when you said a dollar a book, you don't mean a dollar per unit. You mean a dollar per title per book that you write, right? No, I mean, like literally once you have a book out, you're going to make about a dollar per book that you sell. Okay, a dollar per per unit. unit. Yeah, like if you sell a thousand books on Amazon, that's probably about a thousand dollars in your pocket after costs and everything else. Got it. And Um, the retail is, is 10 bucks or something. Yeah, and even if you're going to a big house publisher, your cut is going to be about, I mean, we have one client, she's written 46 books. She's a prolific writer. She does not make money from writing books. Like once you start selling these books, there's a lot of costs involved in selling the books and marketing your books. So you make so little, unless again, you're a celebrity author that's getting a $20,000, you know, upfront, but most people are not there. (laughs) Yeah, most people. (laughs) So you want to write a memoir on finding your father through DNA. Wow. I'm intrigued. Uh What are you willing to share right now on this story? Oh my gosh. Like, is this a three day podcast? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I grew up never knowing who my dad was. My mom always said my dad died before I was born, you know, when I was really little and she never told me. And then when I was 30, she sent me this long letter saying, I feel the need to tell you that I got pregnant when I was 18 by a guy that it was a one night stand. I didn't even know, like I knew his name was Tom. That was it. I was 30 when I learned that. And I was just like, what do you do with this information when you're 30 years old? (laughs) You know, it doesn't change your life. So you kind of go, it's interesting. Well, then DNA testing started coming out. And so two years ago, 
my husband says, you, you should find your dad. You should find, I was like, how do you find somebody based on their first name? Even through DNA testing, I think it's still a lot of, you know, needle in a haystack. And so I did the DNA test. I sent it off and it came back and I see, oh, well, here's my nationality. I knew my mom's side was all Italian. So I was like, all right, anything that was not Italian, that was my dad. But I'm looking through all the data going, is your name Tom? Do you know somebody named Tom? You know, you get all these requests like, oh, we're fifth cousins. We're third cousins. And I would say, oh, that's great. Do you know anybody named Tom? <laughs> like, it was still a deal in a haystack. So I was like, yeah, whatever. This is a full-time job. I don't have time. So I left it. A year goes by. I get a Facebook message from a woman. She says, I just did my DNA testing and we show that we're closely related. And I gave her the same response. Oh, that's great. You know, I got on here trying to find my dad. All I know is his name is Tom. And she replied back and goes, OMG, that's our dad. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so just like that, when she did hers, we matched as sisters. And then I flew out to Napa, met her. Our dad's still alive. He lives in Vegas. Found out his last name is DeBoard. So I was like, oh, Tom DeBoard. And I wrote him a letter saying, I'll fly out to Vegas. I'd love to meet you. You know, like, I'd love to find out more about you. I sent him this letter. I wait, I wait. He replies back and goes, I don't want to meet you. And he says, you know, you're the result of a chance encounter many years ago. So after all this story, like major rejection. And then again, I'm faced with the thing of what do you do with that? And you could just sit there and have a pity party, which I did for about an hour. You know, I don't know why that's part of my story, but it does help me put in perspective other rejections in business, in life. And, you know, there's a book called The Beautiful No, N-O. And in our life, we get a lot of rejections. We get a lot of no's that at the moment we think they're horrifying and they're shattering our life. But when we look back at them, we see the beauty in them. And we see how that no led me to another yes. And that's how I'm looking at it. It's a beautiful well, no. I can't imagine that chance encounter not taking place and then you not existing because exactly. just having this experience in learning your story and being inspired by you and just seeing this tremendous amount of value that you provide people. It's just, it's very inspiring to me. That's, that's very nice of you to say. It's funny because he ended his letter with, please do not contact me again or any of my family members. And immediately I thought, oh my gosh, what a horrible person. And then I sat down and thought, wait a minute, he can't tell me what to do. So I wrote him another letter and I said, first of all, if you knew me, you would know I always have the last word. And I need to tell you what an amazing person and amazing life that I have. And I told him about my husband and my four kids and all the stuff I had that was amazing. And I said, and now you will never hear from me again. And I sent that letter because I was like, he can't tell me not to write to him again. And yeah, you're right. He needed to know. Who knows? He may not have even opened the letter, but. I'll ask a deep kind of cyclical question for you. I noticed that you studied psychology and what led you to that arena? And how have you used it today and how has it helped you? I mean, psychology has helped me in everything. I find people fascinating. What led me to study psychology was probably more of a slacker answer in college that it was like I was interested in those classes and didn't think I was good at math or sciences. So I went that route. But I'm just a naturally curious person and I love hearing people's stories. And so I think psychology is all about, you know, once you hear someone's story, it just opens up that relationship and you immediately find all the little fibers that you connect with and you say, how could you not like this person? I don't care what their background is. I don't care where they came from. I don't care what their religion is or their sexual orientation. It's like once I hear their story, there's immediately I love that person. Like you just go, I need to know more about them. So to me, I wish it was a required class for everybody because it just teaches us to kind of dig into the whole human psyche and learn more about people and be curious. I love that. Another question I have for you is, I know that your co-working space is a women-focused operation, which I think that that's a, a tremendous movement right now. A simple question for you, why are, and this is what I'm noticing from my perspective, but I feel like women are doing really well right now in business. I feel like a lot of problems, not all of them, but a lot of problems um, have been solved, I think, or at least are being solved or in the process of being solved. So what are some things that some takeaways I would say from that general mindset, that general mentality? I don't know if I should say a woman folks mentality or feminine or anything like that, but give us some learnings here. What are some <laughs> takeaways here? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because number one, I feel like this is a time when we're seeing so many things being done, but I think 
the number one, the kernel at the bottom of it all is stories. I think women are finally telling their stories, which when I hear a woman tell her story, I hear it and go, okay, that's possible. What I thought was impossible before, suddenly I hear a story of another woman doing something. I go, that's possible. So to me, there's more women sharing their stories, which encourages that next woman to say, okay, I didn't think I could do it, but I think I can do it now because I heard somebody else do it. The whole co-working thing is interesting because I went into a bunch of co-working spaces here in Denver and that I kept calling them bro working places because I felt completely out of place. Like literally I felt like number one, I was older than most people and number two, I was female. So I felt like walking through the dorm room or the frat house to be more specific where everyone was turning like, oh, somebody's mom is here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I walked through going, wow, I don't feel like this is where I belong. And so then I'd find others and I'd find some spaces that were, you know, pretty mixed. But then again, I felt older than most people there. So I wanted to focus on a space that really, I mean, women work differently. They talk more than men. <laughs> we want to share those stories and hear those stories more often. And so I wanted a space where women felt safe because a lot of co-working spaces are 24-7 I wanted it to be in a really safe area. I wanted the center of the space to be about stories. And so we have a podcast room, media room, 27 offices, conference rooms. It's not a large space like a WeWork. It's like a 14,000 square foot space with offices and, you know, conference rooms and places. But we're going to do monthly storytelling where people share their stories. And we have a media podcast room to encourage people to get out there and share their stories. So I feel like this is a time when women are hearing and seeing more possibilities. And I just think it's through hearing those stories. I mean, you know, we had our first black president and suddenly every black young child goes, dang, it's possible. I think when we see somebody doing something, we all of a sudden go, oh, my paradigm just shifted. Now I know I can do that if that's what I wanted to do. And I just think we're seeing a lot of that happen with women moving into positions that other women are seeing and going, okay, I can do that. Well, I mean, I notice I've been reading a lot about how sales is now converting into a much more consultative, you know, compassionate, empathetic, storytelling based paradigm, you know, and that some people are thriving and they're really doing well in that format. And other folks, I feel like are really struggling because that's not where they come from. It's more of a an alpha or close, close, close situation, kind of a boiler room vibe. What is your takeaway? I mean, how much of your time is spent selling and what are some some kind of tactical tips that you can provide to us on how we can be better salespeople? I mean, better sales, better storyteller is all about vulnerability. And it goes back to that. If we're comfortable being our real self and being vulnerable to be wrong, to be, I mean, I can't tell you how often I realize somebody tells me something and I, okay, wow, that isn't what I knew before, but this changed the story for me. And being willing to say that instead of the ego getting in the way, which is hard for everybody. I think it's easier for women because we naturally come at things a little more empathetic. And I say that and I'm going, but I know a lot of amazing empathetic men who are okay with being wrong or it's interesting. I know some who are okay being wrong in a certain audience, but if the testosterone (laughs) rises up when they're in front of another man and they don't want to be wrong or be vulnerable. And I think vulnerability is one of those things that's a really, it's a skill we all need to work on. And I think putting that transparency out there and there's such overused words, you know, companies need to be transparent, but it just means like we said in the very beginning, it just means being real. So how can companies be more transparent and how can we as individuals, both as business people, but just as humans, yeah. be more vulnerable? You know, it, it does take practice because I found it's a skill in a business. We have to start practicing it in our meetings from the leadership all the way down of sharing things that I'm thinking that this is going on with my team. And instead of me making assumptions, I need to go in and say, this is what I'm thinking. I think everybody should be reading Brene Brown's books. I think her last one that I just read was Lead Greatly. It's a one with leadership in it. It was a powerful book on being vulnerable at work with one another and saying, this is what I, I'm perceiving to be happening. Tell me, what's your story on it? Um, hearing each other out instead of me making an assumption and making decisions based on my assumptions. 
So I think it takes practice. I think it's a cultural thing. Is it okay really to make mistakes? You know, people say that all the time. Oh, here, we're encouraged to make mistakes. And if somebody totally screws up, are we willing to say, let's talk about what we all can learn from this? Or do we still kind of punish people for making mistakes? And are people still afraid to ask questions in meetings? And I see a lot of meetings where there's a strong personality who's so unaware, who has so little self-awareness that they don't realize they talked the entire time. And everybody else has something to say, but nobody was asked for their opinion. And I think that's where it's fostered, is in those small places. And for a sales team to have a sales leader who can be vulnerable and say, you know what, I wanna hear from you. I wanna hear your input on this. And I mean, it's not an easy answer, I think we all have to do better inviting others in and not mm. just being, I'm the expert. Like when people tell me, oh, you're a digital marketing, a social media expert. I always say, number one, there's nobody who can be an expert in this industry because we it changes every single day. But we're all students of it. I've just been in school for a long time. So, you know, be okay to say we need to learn every day and we need to be open to learn something new, a new perspective, a new story. And I, I think that's where it can start. Well, there's a great paradox in there, which is that the, the path to success, the path to building trust, to growing is actually through vulnerability yeah. and it's being honest and it's being open and sometimes admitting that you made a mistake and that you're wrong and that you're a student. And I really connect to that. And to realize that our failures are the compost that grows that next generation of gardens in our work. So when we put stuff out there and it's a total you know, failure, to look at that and say, we could not have grown that other idea had we not had this failure. So looking at failures, not that we want to celebrate doing anything wrong because we would have, it would have been awesome if that first idea took off. But when it doesn't, to look at that and say, you know what, you can't get great until you get started. And it's always, I mean, you know, if you do a podcast, you do videos, you know, our first few podcasts, not few, my first lots of podcasts and videos were so horrible that I look back and go, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I published those. But I want to keep them because I look and go, look how the progression moved once I got started. And sometimes we just want to only start once we're great. You're still going to have failures when you start. So just get started and let those be the compost. Let those be what fertilizes the ground because what's going to come next is going to be amazing. Well, I think... You touch upon a kind of an interesting point for me. I mean, one of my biggest complaints is that as young people, you know, I have two kids. My first just turned six years old. And I'm realizing that he's growing up in a culture where there's eighth place trophies and that you get a sticker for everything. And that if there's some issue, there's maybe he has a learning disability. Maybe he needs some sort of medication. When I say he, I just mean any kid, really. Yeah. And that yeah. there's some external issue potential that needs to be overcome by going to a therapist or a psychologist or a professional and that, that he or she, the child is going to get fixed on their path. And, you know, that frustrates me mm -hmm. because I think for a couple of reasons. Number one is that you grow into, let's just say, the business world. And that idea of embracing failure, I have not seen that experience. You see it in startups. You see it in some Silicon Valley companies. You know, if there's enough venture capital, you see it in places where people have true perseverance and are able to endure a lot of things. But overall, I would say, at least from my perspective, you know, corporate America, I don't think does a great job of embracing failure because, you know, my theory on being successful, product development, selling, you know, finding product market fit, scaling, getting to a point where you have a successful business is through mistake making and it's through right. failures. And it's through those learnings and through that success, through failures and through learnings that you're actually able to, to succeed and go to a larger place. So, you know, I think about this a lot from a, a young person's perspective and how they're going to be able to sort of integrate into the business world and what that's going to look like. Do you have any kind of uh, takeaways or any tips? Yeah, I mean, and, and one thing we used to always tell our kids when, you know, when they did something is when things don't work out the way they wanted them to, you know, whether it was, you know, didn't take for a second or third at the Taekwondo tournament or, you know, their soccer team lost every single game that season. Um, do we take time to debrief and really look at, you know, in life, I love art as well. And I always look at and go, when something I'm painting doesn't look beautiful, I always say I probably need seven more layers, at least seven more layers. And, and in life, when you have failures, it's like, yeah, this isn't where I wanted it to be. But you know what? The good thing is you just need more layers. And whether that's practice, whether that's, you know, experience, whether that's age, muscles, whatever it is. So, but I, I don't think we take the time with kids and in our teams to debrief 
failures and realize that talking about failures is a normal thing and not, we don't talk about failure. We don't talk about, but like, what do we learn from failures? Like there are things we learn from it. It doesn't make them any less painful in the moment, but the next time we're faced with that situation, those lessons bubble up and we remember them. And I think, you know, as parents, just helping our kids see that, yeah, it stinks to lose. And what do we learn from that? And what can we do to prepare us next time? But I also think it's hard when I see so many kids that have such a cushy life and they have no failures and they have, like you said, that everybody wins and everything is easy and parents do things for them. And I worried sometimes I grew up with so much struggle that it made me stronger. And I worry, what if our kids don't have the struggle? Will they have the strength when they're older? But I came to peace with that saying, you know, whether they given an empty bucket to carry and they had to fill it up themselves or whether they were given a full bucket, they still have to decide whether to preserve what's in here and build on it or whether to gather. I mean, there's people, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s with an empty bucket still. They never learned to fill up that bucket. So, you know, to me as parents, it doesn't mean we have to have our kids go through hardship. It means we have to teach them how do we preserve what's been given to you and see that as such a gift, the whole privilege that you have. You know, how do you preserve that and learn the things that you need to learn along the way? It's deep. But I always, I think of that a lot. Wow, my kids have had it so much easier than me. My son, obviously we've been through so much hardship with him, which has affected all of us. But yeah, it's hard. But I think we have to openly talk about it. Well, I love that. This was really inspirational for me. This was, <laughs> this this, was not, this was you're deep. going, this was this not was what we thought we were, where we were going. But you know, <laughs> that's what I love about podcasts is stories take us where we need to go, not off a checklist. Exactly. People ask me a lot, well, what's the format? Can you, you know, send me the questions? I say, absolutely not. Let's <laughs> pretend like we're meeting on a flight somewhere, exactly. and, you know, with a glass of wine and we're just having a conversation. And that's what yeah. this was. But, you know, I think a lot of people need to hear this story. And I think some of my takeaways from this is that, you know, there's something that you mentioned kind of earlier on, which is that in social, it's about sending love letters to our audience, to a small, concise, targeted audience. I really connected to that. Yeah. Yeah. Writing to that one person. I think Anne Handley told a story about that of Warren Buffett. When he writes his financial letter every year, he writes it to his sister. Ah, I really connect to that because that works for writing. That works for video. Think of that one person in your mind, whether it's a prospect yeah. or a friend or an accountability partner, whoever it may be. And then at that point, you can kind of scale it to whoever you'd like. So I really, I really connected to that. You are a doer and you have done a lot of things. A lot of people contemplate to do things. You have done a lot of things. You've climbed mountains. You've started businesses. You've failed. You've gone through a lot of trials and tribulations. You've gone through your own curiosity. And that I really applaud you for that. Because a lot of people, they don't necessarily have the courage to do so. So I hope some people can get the takeaway of being yeah. inspired to pursue that. Take those ideas off the back burner. The flame is out. It's time to get them going. <laughs> well said. There you go. <laughs> and my last is just vulnerability authenticity, you know, being open, being honest, and building trust based on that and just sort of leading into our fallibility and us as human beings. Well, Gina, thank you so much. Where we can find you on social just one more time and LinkedIn and also your website address. Yeah. I mean, you can find me anywhere on social, on any social channel, just at Gina Shrek. That's usually a good place. Um, and it's S-C-H-R-E-C-K. Usually it's a Shrek like the movie, but with C's in there. And then our website is socialknx.com. Thank you so much. This has just been a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks.